the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy is He. Sing a new song to Him who sits on heaven's mercy seat. the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you.
Well, Liberty family, we are so thrilled that you are joining with us again as we worship from our living rooms, from our kitchens, wherever we are. And friends, even though we may be apart physically, there is no doubt in my mind that when we gather together in God's name, he is here with us incredibly wherever we are. So we're so grateful that you have joined us online. I would invite you, if you haven't yet, leave a comment. Check in with us. Let us know that you're watching, that you're participating in this service today. We would love to know that you have joined us today. I also want to remind you that we have incredible prayer teams that are praying for us and with us even right now. So if there is something that God has laid on your heart that you, you need prayer for, I would invite you to leave a comment about that as well. If it's something that you don't feel like is public, just type prayer in the comments and we will reach out to you for that. Also, if God has some, done something incredible in your life or in your family's life, especially during this, this quarantine time, share that with us. Share what God has done in your life, through your life, whether it's, whether it's something at home or through work, whatever it is, we want to rejoice and recognize that God is working and active even now. We are going to continue in worship, so I would encourage you to turn up your volume. Turn off those distractions, and we're going to continue worshiping God together right now. Your blood for salvation, 
You broke the curse for our freedom. Oh, Jesus, you are. You rose from death with the morning. You'll come again in your glory. Suddenly articulate With a thousand tongues to lift one cry Then from north to south And east to west We'd hear Christ be magnified Were the whole earth Echoing his eminence, his name would burst from sea and sky, from rivers to the mountain tops. We'd hear Christ be magnified. So Christ be magnified, let his praise arise. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified. Every creature finds its inmost melody And every human heart its native cry Oh, then in one enraptured hymn of praise We'll sing Christ be magnified Oh, be lifted high be magnified let his praise arise Christ be magnified in me oh Christ be magnified from the altar of my life Christ be magnified in me
I won't bow to idols I'll stand strong and worship you And if it puts me in the fire I'll rejoice cause you're there too I won't be formed by feelings I'll hold fast to what is true If the cross brings transformation Then I'll be crucified with you Cause death is just a doorway to resurrection life If I join you in your sufferings Then I'll join you when you rise And when you return in glory With all the angels and the saints My heart will still be singing My song will be the same Oh, Christ be magnified Christ be magnified in me. Oh, oh, Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Oh, Christ be magnified. Let his praise arise. Christ be Christ be magnified from the altar of my life. Christ be magnified in me. Yes, Lord, that is our prayer. Be magnified in us. God, may, may you increase, may we decrease. Lord, this is all for you. This is all about you. Lord, we give you the glory. We praise your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we're going to continue worshiping just like we've done this whole time here. And we're gonna do that now um, with, with our gifts and our offering. And I'd like to remind you there are three ways you can do that here. Uh, the first way is you can visit our website, findliberty.net. Um, another way is you can use our app. And then finally, you can mail in your gift to us. So let me encourage you to continue um, to worship through, through giving. And we're going to continue to sing here.
acknowledge and we recognize the fact that that we are not holy. And God, according to your greatness, according to your holiness, we don't have the right to come before you. But God, in your mercy and your grace, you made a way for us. You sent your Son in his holiness, in his perfection to take on our imperfections, our sin, our guilt, and our shame. And in doing so, he has given us the ability and the privilege to come before you in worship. So God, we thank you. We thank you for your grace and your mercy, and we worship you for your holiness. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, hey, Liberty Bible Church, it's Pastor Brad. and Thank you for joining us this morning uh, for virtual worship. Uh, glad to be here with you today. Let's, let's settle in and, and, and dial in. And let me start by asking you a question. And, uh, and this is a simple one. You know, I, I ran across a saying once, uh, important words to live by, an excellent proverb of life. And it says this. In a world where you can be anything, be Batman. Always be Batman. You know, growing up, that's, that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be Batman. That guy had a, the coolest car. He had a cool double life. He had a cool pole to slide down. He could 
go and fight crime, and then come back to this awesome bat cave filled with all the most coolest, awesome tools you've ever seen. Oh, it was like my dream. Who wouldn't want to be Batman? So, so let me start by asking you a question, and, and go ahead and write it in the comments, and, and tell the person that, that you're with right now, if there's somebody there, who's your hero? If you could be a hero, who would it be? I guess that's two different questions, isn't it? Who is your hero? And if you could be a hero, who would it be? Go ahead, write the answers in below. I want to see them, and I want to just... let's. See. Okay, there's another Batman. Awesome. You want to be Pastor Brad? Yeah, hey, good choice, good call. Keep it up. Let's... You know, I... Who's your hero? And who would you want to be if you could be a hero? Heroes are a thing that... That's kind of unique because we put our we put our trust in them and we put our our support in them and we really want to you know we want to see them win and and we want to celebrate along with our heroes. If they're sports heroes, we want to watch them you know take the title and we want to watch them win the victory. Uh, in church world, as a pastor, we have pastor heroes, which is really not a good idea to have because it turns out when someone gets elevated to the level of like pastor hero, there's a pretty high likelihood that that somehow they may fall. And I have seen over these past several years so many prominent pastor heroes take spectacular falls. Falls from influence, falls from uh, their, their positions of prominence, falls, uh, moral falls, all kinds of falls. It's, it, it's heartbreaking when you really kind of put your, your, your support behind someone and when you idolize someone and, and then you watch them implode or watch them fall or watch them make all of the bad decisions you're sure they warned other people not to make. And it's interesting, especially in the world of pastors, when, when, when they see a spectacular fall like that, there's kind of a common thread that runs through each one of their stories. And it's one word, pride. Pride seems to be the thing that takes them down. It's this, it's this idea that, that you can do no wrong. Or it's this idea that you can do wrong and not ever get called on it. Or not ever get caught. It's, it's this concept that makes you feel invincible or untouchable. Well, the Bible tells us fairly clearly that, that pride goes where? Before the fall. Pride goes before the fall. Well, we're going to talk a little bit, just for a second, about a, a fallen hero in Scripture. And his name was King Uzziah. And King Uzziah was known as a great king. If, you've, if you want to skim along with, in your Bibles, if you brought them, let's turn to 2 Chronicles 26 and just look a little bit at, at the life of King Uzziah. Now, the book of 2 Chronicles, it, it outlines, you know, so-and-so was the king over Judah, and so-and-so was the king over Israel, and, and, and he was a good king or he was a bad king, and he reigned for so long, and, and, and he fell, and so-and-so took over. And it lists some of their accomplishments. It gives us kind of this whole long litany of the kings that ruled over God's people. And King Uzziah, he is, he is lauded in here. He's, he's promoted as, as a great guy. Listen to this. Uh, in 2 Chronicles 26.5, it tells us that he was a God seeker. Some of the kings sought after their own power. Some sought after their own fame. Some sought the will of God. And he was one of the good kings who sought the will of God. Verse says, Verse 5 says, he set himself to seek God. He was a great military strategist. Uh, in verses 6 and 7, it talks about you know, he made war against the Philistines. And he it lists off of several different cities. He, he broke through the wall of this city. And he broke through the wall of that city. And he broke through the wall of this city. And he set up encampments in this town and in that town. And what was enemy territory, he claimed it and he, as his own. So back then, cities were fortified with walls around them. And when you can break through that wall, when you can break through that wall, you can take that town. And they're, they're now defenseless. That, that wall was their primary defense. He, and it lists all these different uh, foreign enemy lands where he took down the wall. And he took through and got control of the land. He was also a master builder. As, as, as the land was being grown and developed, he was creating great structures. It says he built towers in Jerusalem at the gates. He fortified them. He built towers in the wilderness. And it says he, he, he cut out uh, many cisterns. So he was, he was a, an infrastructure guy. 
he was not only a military guy, but he was an infrastructure guy, and he was building these great things. He was also an agriculturist. He talks about his love of crops and of animals. And the world, the land was thriving during this time. The animals were thriving. The crops were thriving. The, the, the nation was thriving because the enemies weren't attacking anymore. King Uzziah was a great king because the people felt protected and they felt prosperity while he was in charge. It says he was a gifted engineer. Uh, verse 15 talks about in Jerusalem he made machines invented by skillful men. You know, sometimes in our minds we kind of think of, of biblical stories as, as this prehistoric time, but he built machines for defense. He built machines to defend the city and defend the wall. He did these great things, but he ended his reign. He, he reigned in Israel, I think it was 52 years, but he ended his time as an outcast. He ended his reign and died alone outside the city gates because he was a leper. See, what happened with King Uzziah is that he felt he could do no wrong and, and he went into the temple to burn incense as a fragrant offering to God. The problem is, that wasn't his place. That wasn't his position. That, that responsibility and that honor was reserved for the priests. But he went in, he was going to go ahead and do that himself. He knew better. He could make that decision. He could make that call. He went in in defiance of God's rules and in defiance of God's laws. It says some 80 priests, I think it was, tried to stop him, but, but it didn't stop him. And as they came in and confronted him, all of a sudden, leprosy broke out on his forehead. He had the incense in his hand, and, and the disease broke out across his head. I read one uh, biblical commentary that says that it basically says, you know why that broke out on his head? Because his problem was one of the mind. His problem, his, his, his fatal flaw, as it were, was that in his mind he was greater than he actually was. He didn't have a right perception of who he was. In his mind, he was elevated to the level that didn't belong to him. Verse uh, 5 of 2 of Chronicles 26 says, As long as he sought the Lord, God made him prosper. As long as he was seeking after God's will, he was finding victory. He was finding prosperity. And then uh, in verse 15 uh, and 16 it says, For he was marvelously helped until he was strong. But when he was strong, he grew proud to his destruction. So he didn't have a right view of who he was. And he didn't have a right view of who God was. The leprosy broke out. And I think that should be a cautionary tale for us. That should be the kind of thing that says, you know, okay, yeah, don't get so proud. And for some of us, we're not probably in danger of being great military guys or running uh, incredible cities or kingdoms. But, but sometimes, sometimes we get proud in who we are. Sometimes we get proud of our, of our holiness. We're like, oh, I got it all together. I'm better than the person next to me. I'm better than the person down the street because I'm so much more religious than they are. Don't let that kind of pride creep into your thinking. We need to keep a right view of who God is and a right view of who we are. And today we're going to focus on the holiness of God. Uh, 1 Peter 1.16 says, For it is written, Be holy as I am holy. So the advice we heard earlier was be Batman if you can be Batman. Well, Peter's advice, be holy. Be holy like God is holy. Chase after that kind of holiness in your life. To live holy. So what does holy mean? Holy, by its literal definition, means set apart. Be different from the crowd. Be different when society is headed in the wrong direction. Be the one that is different than that. Live holy right, live straight, live pure, don't fall into sin, be holy like God is holy. So how do we do that? Well, that's what we're going to look at a little bit today. We are in a series called His, um, what's it called? His Attributes. How awesome. We have been looking at the attributes, the characteristics of God, 
and what Scripture tells us about him, and then how we can apply those characteristics to our own life and live, like Peter said, be holy as I am holy. So we are going to drill in today. If you brought your Bibles, great, or you want to open your apps, or you can check it out later. But we are drilling in today to the book of Isaiah. Isaiah was an Old Testament prophet, and, and, and actually Isaiah was the cousin of King Uzziah. And, and he was a prophet during the same time period. Listen to this, Isaiah 6, uh, starting at right at the first verse, it says, In the year that King Uzziah died. Because everyone reading would have known when that was. That was a big deal. He was the good king. He reigned for 52 years, and, and, and his death became the starting point of a new reality for them. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to the other and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I said, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal that he had taken with tongs from the altar. And he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt has been taken away. And your sin atoned for. And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And then he said, Here I am. And then I said, Here I am. Send me. Isaiah is given an awesome experience, and a rare one. He is given a visual glimpse of God. He sees God. And he sees him in his majesty and his royalty and his immensity. And he sees him in his holiness. There's seraphim there. Those are, those are angels. And they're declaring holy, holy, holy. It's interesting to know, that, and you should keep this in mind, whenever you see a set of three things repeated in Scripture, that, that's saying this is important. This is a truth you've got to dial into. This is something you need to listen into and pay really close attention to. This is something, don't miss this detail. Holy. They're not just saying God's holy. No, holy, holy, holy. Three times it's declared. Holy is the Lord of hosts. It describes the seraphim as having six different wings, three, three sets of two. The first two are covering their eyes because they're in the presence of, of a holy God. And out of reverence for him, they're, they're being hidden away. Two more wings are covering their feet because their feet are, are again in the presence of God. So they need to be kept reserved away. And then two more wings are on them in order to fly, in order to go and do the will of God. I, I'm being reverent to God by not being able to see him and I'm, and I'm covering my feet in his presence I'm be, and I'm covered up, but yet I've got the wings to go and do they're declaring his holiness holy 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 is the lord god isaiah had an opportunity to have a view of god to see with his own eyes god his his view of god was a right view of god see all too often i think we get a, a wrong view of god I think too many times we try to see God through our lens. We try to see God as, as one of us, but maybe a little higher up the command chain. We, we try to see God as, as thinking the way we do, as having the emotions that we do, as having the reactions that we would. We see God through a, through a human lens. But Isaiah got to see him in his glory and got to see him in his majesty. And friends, someday we'll be able to do that too. And what an amazing day that will be. But he got to see a glimpse of something we don't normally get to see. And, and, and he wrote it down for us. Holy, holy, holy is being declared in his throne room. His train, it says, is filling the room. 
Imagine the, the immensity of a God who, who just part of his outfit is so big that it fills the entire room that he's in. He got to have a right view of God. And when he had a right view of God, he realized a right view of himself. So the question becomes, how do we live in light of God's holiness? See, I don't just want us to focus on God being holy and go, okay, he's holy, I'm going to go back about my business now. But I want us to say, okay, God's holy. And if God is, is set apart and set different from everything we've ever experienced, what does that do to us? How do we live compared to God's holiness? And there's three things I want us to take away today. First is this. Because God is holy, we need to know our place. That's the first one. The, number, the second one is, because God is holy, we need to know our Savior. And because God is holy, we need to know our mission. So let's dive into his word. Let's, let's dissect different parts and see what we can learn about that. But first, will you pray with me, please? Let's pray. God, this morning, thank you for this day. Thank you for a day when we can gather as your children digitally and hear from your word. Because your word, whether it's spoken or written or on a screen, whether we hear about it in a room with our fellow Christians, whether we learn about it at home or hear it in the car, wherever we're at, God, your word is unchanging. And your truth is real. And the concepts that you have for us are unchanging no matter what the format. So thank you, God, that today we can virtually gather, that we can hear from your word, that we can take away what you have for us today. So help us, God, to, to, to listen in. May the words and ideas that we hear today be from you and not from me. Speak to our ears. Speak to our hearts. Speak to our minds, God, we pray. In Jesus' name and for his glory, we pray. Amen. So I mentioned those three things we need to do. We need to know our place, we need to know our Savior, and we need to know our mission. So let's start with know our place. Sometimes we play the comparison game. When I was in sales, I, I, I not only you know, had my sales figures, but I also wanted to know where I was relative to the other guys I worked with. Who was, who was selling the most? Who was putting up the most? Who was, who was the big, you know, the, the top winner that month? Who, who was doing the most? Who was the most effective? In my church life, because I came from that business perspective, I, I started out with that same kind of comparison too, and it led to some very hard lessons that I needed to learn years and years ago, where I was comparing my campus to the other five that our church had, and, and, and who was doing what, and what was, what was working, what wasn't, but what were we doing better than that church, and this church better than that church. And, and I think we, we often compare ourselves to our coworkers. We compare ourselves as parents to other parents. The internet is terrible for that. Because when you're looking at the internet, you're looking at someone's, you know, edited, selected, filtered, chosen highlight. You're looking at the picture that was posed. You're looking at the story of the husband and wife that it, when you look at just their Facebook page, it's like, oh, everything is so perfect with them. And yet here I'm living this life where the house is a mess and the kids are sick and the dog just threw up on the carpet and nothing here is going right. Let me, let me take a picture of that and put it on Facebook real quick. See, it doesn't work like that. But in our minds, we're always comparing ourselves to someone else. We're comparing and, and we're making judgments. You know, right now, right now, take a look at the person next to you and, and make a quick judgment. Who's holier? Who's holier? Is it you or is it them? Or if you're by yourself, the next person you see walking down the street, make a quick judgment. Who's holier? Go ahead, I'll wait. What's your answer? Yeah, see, that doesn't matter. That doesn't matter because holiness isn't a way that we compare ourselves to other people. Holiness is a measuring stick we use to compare ourselves to the one who is holy. To the one who is holy who is God. And what Isaiah realized when he saw God in his holiness is he got a glimpse not only of God's holiness but of his unholiness. All of a sudden the comparison wasn't between him and the next guy. Isaiah was a pretty good guy. Isaiah was a prophet of God. God was using him for things. He was... You know, part of the royal family, extended as it was, but, you know, he, he had it going on. He had it pretty good. But when he compared himself to the holiness of God, he knew instantly he did not measure up. He cries out, he says, Woe is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, 
and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. Why? For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. When he had a glimpse of God's holiness, he realized fully his unholiness. See, sometimes we think, oh, I'm a good person, right? That doesn't make you holy. Goodliness is not godliness. It never will be. Sometimes, you know, we think about, you know, goodliness, that's, that's something on, on the outside. You can look at my good works and my good deeds and my donations to charity and all these things I do, and boom, check it off the boxes, right? Goodliness isn't godliness. Godliness comes from the inside. It comes from the heart. And we know that inside our thoughts aren't always pure. Our minds aren't always pure. Our decisions aren't only, always purely motivated. Behold, I'm a, people of un, I am a person of unclean lips. In the people of an unclean lip. When Isaiah got a glimpse of God's holiness, it was so clear to him that he no longer measured up. His sense of self was suddenly put into a perspective against a holy God. So because of God's holiness, the first thing we need to do is we need to realize, just like Isaiah did, we need to know our place. And once we know our place, the next logical thing is we need to know our Savior. Let me take a little tangent here. What's the best cleaning tool you've ever used? What's the best cleaning tool? For me, my life changed at the invention of a Mr. Clean sponge. Oh my goodness, stains that were on a wall, boom, came right out. It was the coolest thing. I love those things. They're, they're, they're amazing, and I usually wear them down until there's nothing left. What's the best cleaning tool you've ever used? Go ahead, write it in the comments or share it with somebody nearby. You ever hear of Coca-Cola as a cleaning tool? I heard about this once from a, I think it was a teacher. I was in maybe eighth or ninth grade and, and, and talked about, he was, he was a Navy man originally. He was, and in the Navy, they used Coca-Cola to clean the guns of a battleship. I was amazed. I was, that, that was the craziest thing I'd ever heard. Have you ever heard of Coca-Cola? There are entire websites actually devoted to the ways to use Coca-Cola as a cleaning product. You can clean the lenses of your car with it. You can clean your battleship guns if you have them. There, I saw in a video this week where someone put a rusty wrench into just a glass of Coke and let it sit there and then brought it out, rinsed it off. All of the rust was gone. And if it's that great of a rust remover, what an incredible job it must do on our intestines, don't you think? But anyway, it's still delicious. So it was, you know, there's a, I saw someone cleaning a toilet with Coca-Cola. You put it in, the bubbles start cleaning the sides, it removes rust deposits, it just, there's a whole world of things you can do with Coca-Cola. It's a great cleaning product. Well, historically, one of the great cleaning products was heat. One of the ways to purify something was with heat. When you had metal, when you had silver that was mined out of the ground or gold that was mined out of the ground, it was mixed with all kinds of impurities. But if you wanted to take what was impure and make it pure, they couldn't pour coke on it. You would heat it. You would heat the metal till it was a glowing red hot. And what would happen was all the impurities would get burned away. And what you would be left with would be pure gold. What you'd be left with be, would be pure silver. And thousands of years later, that's still the same process we have for purifying gold and silver that gets mined out of the ground. It gets heated, superheated until the imperfections are gone. And then what you're left with is pure. Well, as Isaiah is declaring himself as unholy and a man of unclean lips, I'm not saying the right things, I'm not living right, I'm surrounded by people who aren't living right, what do I do? And one of the seraphim says, takes, takes a, a burning coal from a fire. He takes a burning coal and flies over to him, and he puts it on his mouth. Verse 6 says this, Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal, that he had taken with tongues from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. And then listen to this line, Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. Because of this burning coal touching your lips, your guilt is gone, and your sin was paid for. Now in the Old Testament, to have your guilt taken away and to have your sin taken from you, it required a sacrifice. 
In order to have your sin atoned for, a, a price had to be paid, and that price involved blood. So there was a whole process set up where people would bring an animal, a pure animal, to be sacrificed at the temple so that a blood payment could be made, so that their sin could be forgiven, and it could be atoned for, so their guilt could be taken away. Now, we don't live under that system anymore. Because what happened for us was Jesus came. Jesus came and gave himself as the perfect sacrifice. He was sinless, yet took on the punishment of our sin. He lived a holy life, yet took on a criminal's murder. He lived a perfect life, but died the most painful death. And then, after that death rose again, because he was stronger than sin, which he conquered through the death, and stronger than death itself, which he conquered through the resurrection. And he did that for us. He paid that price. The price was paid so that we didn't have to pay it. His sacrifice was a once-for-all payment for all of humankind. All we need to do is accept that gift. So through him, your guilt is taken away and your sin is atoned for. That gift was given for us. And all we need to do is accept it. Say, Jesus, I, I accept the gift of your sacrifice. And, and I put you as, as the Lord and Savior in my life. I put you in charge. And I will live the way you tell me to. And we'll get to that, actually, in our third point in just a second. But see, because of the sin of the world, the price was paid by Jesus to have it forgiven. So just as that coal was put to Isaiah's mouth, and he was declared, your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for, when you've accepted the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ, and the gift he gave us through his death and resurrection, then your guilt is taken away, and your sin is paid for. When confronted with the holiness of God, we need to know our place. And just like Isaiah, we need to know our Savior, the thing that cleanses us in the presence of God. The third thing is that we need to know our mission. Know your mission, the call of the Lord. You may not know this, you may not realize this, but God has a purpose for your life. God has something amazing planned for you. But he's not going to force you into it. He's going to give you an opportunity to say, Yes, Lord, I will follow what you want me to do. Or he'll give you an opportunity to say, No, Lord, I'm going to live in defiance of whatever it is you're asking me to do. He's wired you a certain way. He's gifted you a certain way. He's prepared you throughout your life to do what it is he has planned for you. And I can't tell you what that is. I can point you to some resources to help you take some tests, some online assessments that say, well, here's how God has gifted you. Here's the, the spiritual gifts that scripture lists out. And here's, it seems the ones that you have, they're not 100% accurate, but it's, it's a good place to start from. I know for me, I was put on mission by God to, to do what I'm doing now. But I didn't always do this. I haven't always been a pastor. I, I, I grew up, you know, in a, in a stable home, and, and, and I served, and I volunteered in different places, but this I never knew really fully was, was how I was going to live into my calling. For a while, I, I was pretty sure I knew what it was in my high school and college years. I knew that the ministry was probably the thing for me, but, but I got lured away. I got kind of lured into the business world, and I was good at it, and and I can see now that God used that time to equip me better for this time. God used that season in my life to grow me and equip me for this season of my life. And I developed skills and abilities in this world that now I can use in that world. But the key is to answer the call. For me, it was a literal call. It was, it was standing actually in a room here in this building and in the hallway and someone saying, Yo, Brad, I see this gifting in your life. I see in you these gifts and I don't know what this means or what it would look like but would you be willing to walk with me down this path would you be willing to kind of apprentice me while we discover where your gifts lie 
Well, we discover how it is God wants to use you. And that began a journey for me that I've never looked back on. It's been the most exciting thing to do. Let me tell you a story. As I was going through the education process for this, I was, I was being examined by a board of people and, and, and I had finished a, a kind of a leadership training uh, co uh, cohort. And as the evaluation and the examination went on, the question came out and I said, Brad, where do you see yourself in five years? Where do you want to be? And I just finished reading a, a really good book. It was by the creator of Veggie Tales. Uh, and it's called Me, Myself, and Bob. And it talks about how uh, he tried to do all these incredible things. Phil, Phil Vischer. How he tried to do all these incredible things. He was going to be the next Walt Disney for God. He was going to build an animation empire for God. He was going to build theme parks and merchandising for God. Problem is, he didn't ask God if that's what God wanted him to do. And as the company grew and, and they put all the resources into making their, their first full-length movie, it became clear that they didn't have what it was going to take to finish it. And they began outsourcing lots of different parts. And all of a sudden, this in integrity of the organization began to crumble. And eventually, it led very quickly to bankruptcy. And Phil was out as the head of the company. It's changed hands a few different times since then. But he realized through all of this that he was trying to influence God in what it is he should be doing with his life. So he, he eventually started a new company, and he called it Jellyfish. And he called it that because a jellyfish doesn't swim upstream. A jellyfish doesn't swim against the current. A jellyfish doesn't decide where it's going to go and then go there. A jellyfish is pretty much subservient to the water. A jellyfish will get pushed along by a current, and that's where he's going to go. And he had made the decision, and this is the answer I used in front of that board, where do you see yourself in five years? And this is their company motto. This is their company goal. It's not to build an empire. It's to be right smack dab in the middle of God's will. So my answer to them was, where do you see yourself in five years? I don't know. I don't know what it looks like, I don't know where it's at, I don't know what the town is, I don't know what the title is, but here's my goal, to live into whatever it is God has planned for my life. And I gotta tell you friends, there's something really relieving about being able to say, you know what, I'm not charting the course, and I'm not forcing the steering wheel to turn one way when God's trying to turn it the other, I'm gonna let him rule. I'm going to let him reign. My goal is to be within the circle that he's determined to be his calling for my life. Isaiah hears the voice of God. He's now been purified and cleansed of the lips. And verse 8 says, And I heard the voice of the Lord say, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? And Isaiah responds immediately. Then I said, Here I am, Lord. Here I am. Send me. And Isaiah was put on mission by God. He was sent out as a prophet and as a messenger by God. The next few verses give him his first message to deliver. Go and tell the people this. He didn't argue with it. He didn't stop. And when God said, who, who will go for us? He didn't go, God, I'd like to go and pray about that for a while. And I want to run that by everybody and, and see what they think. And I want to ask a quick poll and find out if people think that that's what I should do. No, he clearly heard God's calling. And he clearly responded with instant obedience. Instant obedience. When he knew what God had for him, he responded instantly. Here I am. Send me. I think all too often we, we know when God is calling us to something. All too often, that nudge in our heart, that thought we can't escape in our, in our brain says, go and do this. And we go, God, I don't know. I don't know if that's really going to be for me. And, and sometimes we stop and go, let me, let me make a list. God, let me make a list of all the advantages and all the disadvantages. Let me make a list of all the pros and all the cons for what it was you want me to do. And then let me get back with you with a decision. Can you imagine if some of the old biblical prophets and, and Bible heroes were like, have to do that? 
Can you picture David outside with Goliath going, you know what? I don't know if God really wants me to fight him. Let's, let me get back to you, Goliath. Let me, let me just check for a minute and find out if this is really, really what I want to do. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go pray about it a little bit. I'm going to go ask my neighbor. And I'm going to call my pastor. And I'm going to blog about it a little bit. And then I'm going to release a podcast. And it's going to be like, what should I do? I don't know. He just went. And he just did. Isaiah responded to God's call with instant obedience. Sometimes we get stuck with paralysis by analysis. We need to stop and weigh the pros and cons. We need to stop and decide about it. Gideon. Gideon was called to go by God, and, he, and, and he's known for what we call the fleece story. He was like, God, I, I pretty much know you want me to go, but I need you to prove it to me. I'm going to put out this, this fleece. I'm going to put out this sheepskin. And, and God, in the morning, how about that, that the dew of the morning dew, that only the fleece will be wet and all the ground will be dry. And then I'll know, then I'll know, God, that that's exactly what you want me to do okay sound like a plan and god in his patience went along with that plan so the next morning gideon gets up you can find this story in judges six next morning gideon gets up and the fleece is there and it's sopping wet and the ground is dry and he goes wow okay Maybe that was just a coincidence. Me, I don't know if really that's what God was telling me. I, I'll tell you what God tomorrow. How about I put the fleece out and the ground will be all wet and the fleece will be dry and then, then I'll know that that's what it is you want me to do, right? Okay? And God, in his amazing patience, did it for him. The next morning, the fleece was bone dry. The rest of the grass and the ground around was soaking wet and Gideon realized what God wanted him to do and that he went ahead and he did it. He needed those steps of confirmation. Sometimes God gives us those, but sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes he just needs us to trust him and to be obedient to him like Isaiah was. Who shall we send? Here am I, God. Here am I, send me. When we have a right perspective of God and a right perspective of who we are, then we'll know. We'll know what the mission is that he's sending us on. And we will have the courage to follow that. Isaiah 41, God is speaking and says, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand when you're going out on mission for God when you're going and doing the thing that he has prepared for you when you're living into the calling that he has on your life you don't need to fear you don't need to worry you don't need to stress because I am with you he says don't be dismayed for I am your God I will strengthen you. Imagine having the, the power of God behind you in your corner. I will help you. I will uphold you with my right hand. Friends, when we walk through this life, or when we face a crisis, or when we face the unknown, when a disease threatens to tear apart our country, we could rest confidently in knowing when we're following God's will, when we're living obediently to his calling, that we will be strengthened and upheld by him according to his will. And we do that through the same three things we've been talking about today. By having a clear understanding of who God is. Our whole series is based on, on, on seeing these characteristics of God revealed where? revealed in his word. So when we're spending time in God's word, we see who God is. There's an awesome Bible study technique that, that, that I, um, I used to teach a study on this, and it was called the Lectio Divina. And it says when you read a piece of scripture, when you read a passage in the Bible, sometimes we read it and we go, oh, that's cool, and we close the book and we go away. But this is a way to, to kind of inductively study what it is we read. And the, and the questions you ask about any passage are what is this saying about God? What is this passage saying about God 
and about who he is? That's the first question you ask. The second question is, what is this saying about me? What is this passage telling me to do or to be or to change? How, how, first, how do I see God and then how do I see me reflected in the words I'm reading? And then what do I need to do or who do I need to share it with? Those are the three steps. I don't know if you noticed, but those are the three steps our whole message has been about. A right view of God, a view of ourselves and our Savior and going on mission for him. So put that into practice. When you read scripture, read it and ask yourself, meditate on it, go, what is this telling me about who God is? What is this telling me about who I am? And what is it that I need to do or change or who do I need to tell about this passage? Know your place, know your savior, and know your mission. And when we're living into those three things, we've got nothing to fear. Liberty, thank you so much for joining me here today. It's been exciting to talk with you, and I cannot wait until we can all gather back together. Until then, we will see some of you in person next week. We'll see some of you virtually next week. But know that either way, we will be in fellowship together, whether digitally or here in the building. Thank you so much for being with me. That's all, folks.